There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean of Sean Breathes Books, my new channel name, and welcome back. So, I don't have a lot to tell you this week. Personally, I looked after Charlie, Mum's dog, for two nights, three days, and that was fun. I've had a good reading week without having finished a darn thing. And I filed a formal gov complaint to, the, to, the, to a government body, the rentalsman here in Saskatchewan, to complain about illegal rent increases in my building. So I'm feeling righteous and well-read, and, uh, um, um, and that's about it. So, without further ado, the most exciting thing in my week, really, was getting a chance to meet this week's exquisitely colorful mystery guest, and now you get to. And today's mystery guest is the writer and artist, Rose Ruain, joining us from Glasgow. Welcome, Rose. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I am a big fan, a new but big fan of Rose Ruane's Instagram, which will be linked in the show notes. So I was kind of expecting you to look uh, this fabulous, but oh my God, you look fabulous, Rose. Thank you so much. So gee, I feel like you've really met my energy and my aesthetic, and I'm very grateful. Well, I uh, hunted through my closet to find the most Rose Ruane-esque blouse I had and this is I think they kind of go together so <laughs> I think it's perfection everything's coming up floral and I think it's a good sign and all of this resonates fabulously with this cover of your second novel which came out in early May Birding holy smokes well why don't we start with this novel tell us about Birding Rose so it's set in a rapidly gentrifying but still extremely run down unnamed British seaside town in the depths of like a very bitter grey winter where the two principal protagonists are middle-aged women in some ways at the same stage of lives that could not be more different Joyce has never left home. She lives in a kind of grey gardens. Whatever happened to baby Jane, like deeply symbiotic, hermetically sealed relationship with her elderly mother. They dress the same, they sleep in the same room and they are sort of physically and metaphorically walled into this tiny seaside flat by a huge collection of China dolls in this very oppressive life where everything has to be meticulously dictated by routine. Whereas Lydia, the other protagonist, is living a sort of deeply chaotic, itinerant life that sort of has the trappings of privilege, but none of the financial affluence. And after a very cynical self-interested me too motivated apology from a former lover it sort of recasts her entire past unravels all her memories of her life up to that point um including the period in the late 90s and early 2000s where she was a one hit wonder having been a serious musician she kind of gave into the music industry and became kind of a novelty pop Act. And so both these women in their very separate ways are feeling completely caged and hemmed in and are trying to break free. And it's very much about the third act of lives and whether or not change is possible. And these people whose wings feel so clipped, can they find some way of flying free from the situations in which they're in? Well, that was a brilliant description. That's fantastic. And they, they eventually cross paths. It's not a spoiler to, to say that, right? No, but, I think they cross paths in quite an unexpected way. They sort of cross paths once in kind of a misconception and then again later in a way that sort of makes it apparent what the misconception is. And I don't think it's a spoiler to say that because I, th I think... So much of the book is 
about our own perceptions of ourselves versus other people's perceptions of us and the moments where we're best placed to understand ourselves and the moments in which actually probably our own self-mythology or self-doubt or all the sort of complex feelings we have about ourselves mean that the way we perceive ourselves is so different to the way that others perceive us. And it's sort of about the complexities of that, I think, in many ways. And there is a, a queer element to how that all plays itself out, right? Yeah, very much. I mean, I think the novel itself in the seaside setting and in the sort of cinematic references that were in my head are very much about camp classics. I've grown to think about my writing, especially in Birding, as a kind of like kitchen sink gothic, like a realist gothic. And it's very, very versed in like camp classics. Like I say, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Grey Gardens, some of the really camp British seaside sitcoms like Heidi High. And then there's very much a storyline about coming to our queerness when we're older. And I think the very complex experience that a lot of older people of my generation who are sort of middle-aged now have seen much younger people than us be much more public, be much more brave. You know, growing up in times that contains some of the sort of threat and oppressiveness that we grew up with and in other ways being freer, uh, sort of more supported, more accepted. You know, they're growing up with their own entirely different set of complications. But I think the ways in which they've managed to be public have empowered a lot of us who are older to say, you know, if I'd grown up in that environment, I would have called myself like queer or bi or pan or gay or lesbian or whatever all along. And if that's the case, why not say it now? You're here. And now I believe Pride is a different time. Uh, is it? Is Pride in August in the UK? It's now. We're in it. It's now. Okay. It's Pride Month oh, in, in the UK So we right are too. Now. So yeah. So how, how lovely that we're having this chat uh, early in Pride. So happy Pride, Rose. Happy Pride. Thank you very much. So tell us about the title. I assume there's some birds flying around somewhere in this novel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the title was quite a layered thing for me about Lydia grew up in a family of, um, I don't know if it's the same where you are, but it's called twitching in Britain, which is bird watching, where you really do it as like a tick list. Yes, yes, yes. yes you know, yes, so yes, that's yes. the kind of bird watching where it's very much about like, you want to see the rarest birds and that's the right. most birds and it tends to be quite gendered towards like cis straight male bird watchers to like do it in that really exhaustive way of like having the biggest collection of names and having like seen the rarest birds. And birding is a slightly different type of bird watching where it's much more about just going to a place and seeing what's there and, you know, sort of enjoying the poetry and spectacle and peace of nature. So it's no spoiler to say that Lydia slowly comes back to the bird watching of her childhood and wants to do it in this peaceful, poetic way. And it's it's in the text that she's a big Mary Oliver fan, that she finds that kind of like poetry where nature and emotion find metaphors in one another and interpolate. That really speaks to her heart. She has this mantra, look to the beauty, which is something that she's finding harder and harder to do. And so she's struggling more and more to do that, to enact that belief she has and to go and spend time in nature, but it was also about the British use of bird for a woman. So it's sort of about birding as being a woman under like the male gaze and under the male influence. It's such a, again, like a cis het male term to use about a woman to call her a bird. And so it's very much involved in that. And, and then the other thing is that, you know, I would not pretend for a second that all my metaphors are subtle. I think if the writing 
is subtle and deft and complicated and has a light touch, you're allowed to use some pretty heavy handed metaphors once in a while. So Joyce and Betty have a little really tragic caged budgerigar that like obsessively tries to get out of its cage. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of subtlety in the text and sometimes that lets me feel quite free to be like, they're caged, I'm going to throw a caged bird in there in my book called Birding and I feel fine about that. How, how fabulous. I'm dying to ask you if you have crossed paths with another queer novel that came out, I believe, last year, might have been the year before, that in which birding plays a maybe not quite the central role it does here in yours, but a fairly central role. It's called Small Joys by Elvin James Mensah. I have a not, gay but black I British that writer. A gay black British writer. And he's been on my channel. It's, I adore that novel. And so I, I think you might like it too. I will literally go and seek it out after this. Love nothing more than a recommendation. Oh, and we're going to get to some of your own in a minute too. And this is your second novel. So maybe we won't spend as much time talking about your debut, but tell us about This Is Yesterday. When did it come out? So sadly, it was one of those books that came out in twenty at the end of 2019, just before the pandemic in Hardback. And then sort of all the promotional events that I had around it were booked for that time, just as all our worlds were sort of unraveling and everything was uncertain. And it was sort of the least bad thing that was happening in the world. But certainly I had a sense of that, but feeling a bit lost and the paperback came out during the pandemic. So it all felt quite... Um, quiet in a way that I know most authors who had books out around then, apart from the biggest names, sort of had quite a tricky experience of publishing then. But it was a coming-of-age novel about a woman in her 40s being thrown back into like her sort of estranged family through her father's dementia and it moved back and forward in time between this really formative long hot steamy summer between the end of school and the beginning of university and and how really that lost troubled adolescent of the 1990s still lived in the very heart of the adult woman in the contemporary passages both in the events that unfold over the book and the secrets that are uncovered and their emotional impact but I think it was so much about those moments in an adult life where we're very aware that actually like a tiny frightened confused adolescent is still at the controls of the big fleshy robot which I think is an experience we all have at times so it was very much about that. Very very relatable and I believe that the, the germ of this story began when you witnessed something from us, the stopped bus, am I right? The stopped train. Stopped um, train. Yeah, I think so often for me as a writer, it is a kind of voracious nosiness about the world that triggers so many different things about how I write and why I write and what makes me begin to tell a story in the first place, just some moment of curiosity or is that one of those moments of really acute presence and noticing of something. And with um, with This Is Yesterday, it was that I was on a train which was stopped uh, and I could see into like a greenhouse and there were two women very clearly screaming at one another and after a while the older started to throw plant pots at the younger and I was so fascinated by this of like who these people would be and what was unfolding between them that had led to like you know I think sometimes you see a thing like that and you think this is like probably some kind of instrumental moment in a stranger's life this is I'm witnessing something that these people will remember forever and it just intrigued me so completely I could not stop imagining who they might be and why they might be arguing and obviously I saw only that and like a little psychopath as writers are I went away and made it all up this thing that probably bears no relationship to 
who they were or what happened, but that's what we do. <laughs> Well, I will forever remember the, a phrase you just put out into the universe, voracious nosiness. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I want it on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Probably if it was going to be on a T-shirt, it would be voraciously nosy. <laughs> I think it's an excellent thing to be, and I think there's something about, you know, sometimes the best thing in the world is to have headphones in on transport or to lose yourself in a book. I know for some people they have really sensory reasons why they need the world to be like quieted and contained and to slightly section themselves off. And sometimes I feel that too, but the moments in which I feel like I have the luxury to really open myself up to the world and eavesdrop and you know, peer out of the window and really be in the world. I feel very grateful for those moments because those are so often the ones in which there are those things that, you know, sow those little seeds that germinate into a story or a character or something for later. Yes. And you also said in the same interview that you write from, and you use a German word that uh, I love now that I've just been introduced to it about 25 minutes ago, you write from Popkino. Can you tell us more about Popkino? Head cinema, brain cinema. So I think those of us who have very vivid pictures in our head, I know it's not the case for everyone. I've sort of learned about um, a fantasia where people don't sort of picture anything that's not how their minds work but I'm someone who has a very visual mind not just in like sort of seizing on things that are out in the world but I can really for good and ill in like you know both in the way of like you know what would psychologically be called maladaptive daydreaming and catastrophizing and also in like beautiful thrilling mind palace ways I can really see what I went to I can really let a scene play out which is not so good when you're imagining everything bad that could come in a situation of a situation in your own life and which is wonderful when you're imagining everything that could and it's very useful as a writer to be able to like really see the clothes your characters wear and the homes they live in and the places in which those homes are located. And I feel very fortunate. You know, I think for other people, their very different ways are their own strengths of their writing. I just feel glad that for me, one of the things I enjoy about writing is the fact that sometimes there's this almost ekphorastic, almost like sort of, as if I'm annotating a film, I really, really see and smell and feel the weather of the world that I'm writing about. You just used one of my favorite words from the last couple of years, acrostic. Yeah. I'm just going to ask if you're familiar with um, any of the, with the, uh, he's, let's see, he's a Scottish writer, um, Douglas Bruton. Yes, I'm very aware, yeah. Um, yeah. So am I. He's been on my channel, and I'm a big, oh, big fan of, of his um, most recent, well, not now, he's had a new one, just come out in the last few weeks, but the one before that, um, that was very ekphrastic. Wonderful. So how exciting. Well, maybe I'll have to get you two to come on my channel together someday. That would be a, a hoot. That would be amazing. Yeah. So the last question before I want to hear about Rose Ruane, the reader, is that, uh, a segue right from what you've just been talking about, you were a, an artist before you were a writer. Tell us about that. So I studied sculpture at art school and I mainly made sort of strange, sad objects and sort of performance to camera work. Um, I made a lot of things that were involved in sort of slapstick and mess and lipstick and I made sort of drawings and paintings as well and writing was always a way of working through my ideas that would become visual work or performances 
or sculptures, and then very slowly they began to change places. And I found myself making fewer and fewer performances and fewer and fewer drawings and sculptures and more, you know, just writing more and more. And then I think I was very fortunate to talk to some people who were writers um, who were like, you know that you could do this as well if you wanted to. And it took me a long time to feel comfortable to say, yes, I want to, I think as women and I think particularly as queer people, like we're meant to be so grateful to have our little efforts at one thing tolerated. You know, I think we're really disincentivized to then go in and take up space and say, no, I can be as good as I want at as many things as I want. I can ask for that. I can believe that I'm capable. It took me a long, long time. But yeah, I, I was a writer in denial for a long time before I could accept that I was a writer at all. And then it took a while for the art to come back. Again, I felt like, oh, you're meant to pick one. And actually it was incredibly liberating to go, you know, I see people all the time not picking one, so I'm not going to either. Well, uh, lucky for us. And you keep quite a lot of time and space in your life for reading, I imagine. What have you been reading recently that you'd like to recommend, Rose? Well, this one's quite tricky for me because I'm just finishing a PhD at the moment. And okay. so I end up reading sort of work for that at the expense of reading for pleasure. It's quite hard to feel. I always have this terrible use that, you know... I. If anybody else said to me that they were feeling guilty about reading for pleasure because they should be reading for work, you know, I would say don't do that to yourself if you can possibly avoid it. But we're all incredibly wise when it's other people and we're all incredibly hypocritical when it comes to ourselves. Um, so yeah, actually, I really missed my usual relationship with reading for pleasure. But one of the most exciting books I have read recently is uh, Dead Animals by Phoebe Stooks, which came out around the same time as Birding. And I was very fortunate to do an event with her in Bristol when we were both launching. And she is a poet and this is her first novel. And it's a slender, visceral, muscular, bloody treat of a book. I mean, it, it's it also, uh, there's a lot of overlap in themes. It's very much about like a female, a queer female experience of straight male sexual violence. So I will say, you know, there's there's a caveat there for readers about, you know, how able at any given point any of us feel to engage with those themes. But it is handled so sensitively and, you know, with such authenticity and even though it's a book of like blood and bone and revenge and rage and it's also an amazing ghost story, you know, it sort of takes the very real haunting of trauma and how that lives in the body and mind and expresses it through sort of, again, I think her writing's quite sort of cinematic and visual and so it sort of takes this supernatural element that makes it feel so of this world and the authenticity of experiencing trauma. I think it's just a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. She does so much in such a short time. And I think it's so rare for quite spare prose to actually somehow achieve an effect of like abundance, but she does. Is she British? Is she Scottish? She's British, yes. She's English. Oh, lovely. West Somerset, I see. Yeah. I am completely in love with a poetry collection called Real Phonies and Genuine Fakes by an American poet by Nikki Beer, who collides all sorts of incredible pop cultural references with the history of art 
and really beautiful, authentic, wry, angry, sad, melancholy, true human, emotional things. Like one of the greatest poems in the collections called Self Portrait as Ducky Dale, the character from the Molly Ringwald film Pretty in Pink. Oh my goodness, yes. And it's just this incredible collision of sort of kitsch and camp with raw and real and sort of camp cinema as an art form with like much more trads art. Um, and I just can't recommend it enough. I have gone back to it so many times since I first read it and always found something further like you know those little complicated illustrations that draw you in as a child where like every time you go back to that book you notice like another tiny thing in that drawing of a house like a real jewel box her poetry feels like that to me that there's always like another little image or another little cleverness and also it's work that wears its cleverness so lightly and so deftly um, in a way that I just find incredibly admirable when people manage that combination of like abundance and restraint. I think it's such a feat. Well, a fabulous title, Real Phonies and Genuine Fakes. I love that. It's got, I think that's Dolly on the cover. It <laughs> certainly is. So how could yeah, you not? That's how right. could you not immediately be drawn in by any book that has Dolly on the cover? That's right. Well, that sounds fabulous, too. The other one that I would like to talk about, actually, if it's okay, is Mrs. S by Kay Patrick, who's another uh, queer Scottish writer. I think we should just check. I want to check their pronouns. Oh, yes, I have. I think it's they, them, I believe. And I have. Yeah. Uh, please tell us about Mrs. S. I have it on my shelf. I haven't read it yet. It sounds amazing. It is absolutely astounding. I mean, again, it's like clear, clearly I'm all in the poetry because it's a novel with a, a poet's sensibility. Like it's almost like a prose poem and it is so evocative of the heady atmosphere of an all girls school, especially if you have, you know, if you're someone who is a visual person who likes cinema, who watches a lot of TV, and if your head works that way, like this is the most sort of sensory, visual novel. Like you can sort of smell the rose garden in which a scene takes place and the sticky carpet in the pub. And also, again, it like makes you very embodied in that sense of like people who are ill at ease in the world and people who don't feel safe, both in like the sort of thrilling danger of this. You know, it's incredibly sensuous and sexy and got like incredibly written sort of queer desire. I think everything about it, like from the body to the garden to the atmosphere, and it's all like one of those incredible pencil sketches where like these tiny slender strokes build up the most abundant, eloquent, articulate picture of the world and the story. And there's an incredible sort of pull of dread that hangs over it. It really reminded me in that sensibility of something like Picnic at Hanging Rock, which has always been like a you know, one of my earliest influences, the classic, like, I saw that film when I was far too young and, like, it made me so uneasy and it scared me, but it also fascinated me and it sort of really became interwoven into my DNA and it has that incredible feeling of what it's like for a lot of young women to be together and that, hot emotional climate as well as like the physically hot climate of the summer it's it's really quite an astounding feat of creativity well i must get to it oh my goodness i am feeling thoroughly entranced by you and the way you talk about your own writing and the writing of others and i'm thinking about something you said about queer people 
not wanting, not feeling they can move between various modes of creativity, that they should take up as little space as possible. And so I want to say to you in closing, Rose Ruane, that I want to give you the keys to my channel and I want you to take up as much space as you possibly might wish to or can uh, going forward. What an amazing guest you've been. Thank you so much for saying that. And thank you so much for having me and giving me the keys to your joyous kingdom. It's absolutely. But uh, I, I'm going to have to go shopping for uh, another blouse for your next appearance. Oh, well, then you've just given me permission to buy another dress for my next appearance. That's so right. I'm very That's happy right. that I can facilitate us both to have a little fun shopping, Jay. I am now stimulated up to my nipples. So, Rose, mission accomplished. Thank you so much. Oh, my absolute pleasure. I really feel like my work here is done, if that's the case. So thank you. Isn't she fabulous? And this novel sounds really good. I hope some of you will check it out. I'm planning to and have her back for a long-form chat about birding. I've been a little busy with getting videos out. I got an episode of Bite Size Book Chats out for the first time this year, I'm pretty sure. And the first time in several months. Yeah, six months or five months. I just, uh, too many things going on personally and other priorities on book two, but I hope it won't be six months before the next one, but that was a the fabulous group of guests. So do check that out if you are so inclined. And then I put up a book haul yesterday. I think it was yesterday. That was my week of book tubing. And then and in terms of uh, books, I have one bail to tell you about my second bail only of 2024. So I am slowly getting my bailing groove back. But I'm not going to make much of this because this is a debut novel that I wish every success for, but it just wasn't for me after 20 pages. Anyone's Ghost by August Thompson. I was planning to have a Zoom discussion with Bernie about it, but I just... Uh, the other thing that I'll say about it that was didn't work in its favor and may have been a kind of a situational thing for me was that it was started out in a very similar... with a very similar plot to... Thomas Gratton's second novel, In Tongues, which I recently had a long chat with him about on my channel, and I loved that novel, and this one just felt like, mm, no, it wasn't going to be the same, but it may be the same for you, so investigate it for yourself, didn't work for me. I'm going to finish one other book over the weekend, I have to, because I'm doing a podcast interview about it on Monday, and that will leave space for two books, one because of that bail, the other because I will finally finish the book in the coming few, next few days. So I'm going to start two books. This is, I love the word penultimate, but is there one for the one before penultimate? What would that be? Well, 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 you learn something new every day. Antipenultimate. Antipenultimate. The, the, the third last uh, published book by Douglas Bruton. Blue Postcards. He talked about it quite a bit when he was at my mystery guest. I won't link to the mystery guest chat. I'll link to the unexpurgated director's cut of the full chat. And he beguiled me with his description of what's going on in this novella, published by Fairlight in 2021. This will be a pseudo-buddy read with Lindy of Lindy's Magpie Reads. And I think we're going to end up chatting with Douglas Bruton himself about it. So stay tuned. But that'll be happening sometime next month. So time for me to get a start on that. And I had kind of forgotten that I put a hold on a queer Korean book. So this will be one of my main queer reads for Pride Month. That uh, came in. It's called Spring on the Peninsula by Ari Shin. God, libraries suck so bad. But the way they put labels, you can't even read the covers. I That just makes me ill. Eri Shin, who I think is a woman. Yes, she is. She was born in Ames, Iowa in 1986. Moved to Seoul in her, the second decade of her life. And I think moved back to the West. So she's not all that Korean. I'm not even sure if she's ethnically Korean. But her name is Eri Shin. And this is a novel about a, a bunch of millennials, most of them queer, in Seoul. So let's see what that's all about. It just came out this year, I think. Yep, 2024 release. I may or may not finish it this month, but this will be my main pride read. Although I am finishing up a, uh, 
The novel that I have to finish up this weekend is also a queer novel, so... My readerly observation of Pride Month this year has been quite minimalist. I have had to let go of participating in most themed readings throughout the year because that's how my current reads just swells to ridiculous proportions. So I'm going to be ignoring most of them or, you know, maybe reading one book if I can possibly fit it in. But um, all of the books behind you, 90% of them, they don't pertain to any of those themed readings, and I'm more interested in reading those, actually, whether they be new releases or not. I'm also noticing that I'm not reading a whole lot of backlist, I'm not reading a lot of translated literature, and I'm not reading some of my, you know... But when I say backlist, I haven't been reading the ladies, the mid-20th century female novelists, from, especially from Britain, that really float my boat, so... For example, I haven't gotten to Rosamund Lehman this year, and I have her next one. I'm doing her chronologically. I've given up on Edna O'Brien on the chronological reads because they, they, her mid, mid-career novels were awful. But I'm hoping that doesn't happen with Rosamund Lehman, and so far I'm loving them all. Because I have a buddy reader, Leah, I've been keeping up with the Elizabeth Jane Howard chronological reading project. In fact, we've upped it. We've increased the frequency. We're doing two a year, but I, a whole bunch of those ladies are, are feeling rather neglected, so I need to make further changes, I think. The, mainly the books I'm getting through on a timely basis are buddy reads, and if I'm not buddy reading a book, it's really difficult to fit it in. So, these are the fabulous problems of, of a first world bibliophile, I tell ya. Anyway, that's my Friday Reads. Thanks for watching.